reading. Notes on Deconstructing Installation Art by Graham Coulter Smith. Tiravania's Untitled Free, 1992, a work in which the artist prepared Pad Thai every day for a month in the 303 Gallery in New York, is a prime instance of a mode of art that focuses on human interactions rather than on precious objects. However, Bishop accuses him of creating artificially harmonious situations rather than focusing upon a more critical engagement with the everyday. Bishop says, ultimately, Tiravania's work tends not to destabilize our self identificatory mechanisms, but to affirm them and collapse into everyday leisure. It is certainly the case that the mere involvement of the viewer does not lead to a condition of activated membership. Let's consider Angela Bullock's beanbags. Bullock's beanbag works provide another instance where an artist offers a participatory role for the viewer. For Flexible, a 1997 installation, she provides large, brightly coloured beanbags, a CD player and headphones so that visitors could chill out on the beanbag listening to music. In another installation, for the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris, she placed beanbags in front of monitors showing videos of recently released films. In each case, the viewer is not presented with a work of art. Instead, the viewer is placed in a situation that radically questions our tradition relationship with artworks within a gallery environment. One can understand these chill-out zones as a deconstruction of the self-importance of the gallery environment and the way in which it frames the viewer as one who should submissively and respectfully contemplate what is on exhibition. One can also understand these works as turning the power over to the viewer. Bullock herself notes, it was interesting to me that the person looking at the piece was involved in level of power given to them unexpectedly, or that they could take upon themselves to use. This renegotiation of power interested me. In the case of the work cited, the power unexpectedly given to the viewer was the ability not to look at the art. That is certainly a step away from being conditioned to focus respectful attention on great works of art, but it is not participatory art. The viewer remains in the role of a passive consumer. What is more, it is the artist, not the viewer, playing a creative game. The game Bullock is playing is to point to the power afforded to the artist. But it is only possible because Bullock is an artist, a status paradoxically defined by the fact that her deconstruction of the defining role of the art gallery is on exhibition in an art gallery. We find a similar uh, problem in Tiravania's work. It is difficult to see eating pad thai as a creative engagement. That, of course, is the point. The ingenuity of Tiravania's work lies in his very simple solution to the problem of bringing art into everyday life. He takes the Duchampian ready-made to its logical conclusion and declares that everyday life is art. But this solution is flawed, because as with Bullock's chill-out pieces, there is no creative game involved except the game that the artist is playing. The viewer simply eats pad thai, but the artist is making a statement that is located within the language game, which is the Duchampian ready-made. Marcel Duchamp played on, to, on the traditional concept of artistic genius by claiming that anything that the artist chose to be an artwork 
was a work of art. But this is not the whole story. By the 1960s, it became apparent that what Duchamp's ready-made really revealed was that it was not the artist who frames the object as a work of art. It is the gallery or museum. It is only when the object is exhibited in an art gallery, and better, an art museum, that it becomes a work of art. The fact that Tiravania's convivial gatherings are always located in an art gallery reveals the nature of the art game being played in these instances. As Peter Berger points out, given the avant-gardist intention to do away with art as a sphere that is separate from the praxis of life, it is logical to eliminate the antithesis between producer and recipient. It is no accident that Tristan Tsara's instructions for the making of a Dadaist poem and Breton's for the writing of automatic texts have this character of recipes. This represents not only a polemical attack on the individual creativity of the artist, the recipe is to be taken quite literally as suggesting a possible activity on the part of the recipient. The automatic text also should be read as guides to individual production, but such production is not to be understood as artistic production, but as part of a liberating life praxis. This is what is meant by Breton's demand that poetry be practiced, pratiquer la poésie. Berger takes us back to the origin of the discourse of deconstructive art and thereby helps clarify the project of bringing art into life that Dada initiated. Crucial to this project is the concept of intersecting the practice of life with creative process. The games that were devised, such as ready-made, automatism and montage, were supposed to be playable by anyone. They were a door into everyday life. But artists kept the games to themselves. Or, more accurately, the art system, which is always the condition of the possibility of the continued existence of art, ensured that, that the products of such games were treated as precious objects created by individual art geniuses. And who could resist such adulation? <laughs>